When I was a child, I used to go and stay at my great-grandfather's house in South Miami. Um, he had moved to Miami in 1896. And so when I knew him and when I came into being able to remember things about four or five years of age, he was already in his late 80s. He lived to be very old. And um, he lived down in South Miami in this beautiful neighborhood that he had built the house in the 1950s, big, beautiful house that was there. He was one of the founders of Miami. He owned Ramsey and Sons Lumber Company on Miami River for many years before he sold it. But my great-grandfather was just a, a, a great lover of garden, and he had about an acre of land, and in his later years, he just gardened and gardened. There was a rock wall on the back of his property. And just over that kind of fallen down coral rock wall was a little cottage. And the little cottage that was on the other side, um, we would go and occasionally go play around that area in the 1970s and 1980s. And that cottage that was there, he would tell me about the man who had built the cottage many, many years before. His name was Robert Frost. Not sure if any of you have ever heard of Robert Frost. But Robert Frost was a poet. He was a poet from New England. And he was a poet that was very famous. And as he got older, came into his 70s and his 80s, he didn't like the cold winters like he used to. And so he would come stay in South Miami um, during those winter times. Robert Frost wrote what would become one of my favorite poems. Poetry is an amazing thing. Poetry is beautiful. We have a man in the name of our, in our church, Mr. Ralph Wetley. Is Mr. Wetley here this morning? I'm not sure if he's here. They had to go back to North Carolina for a little bit. I don't see any movement. Mr. Wetley was a, a retired airline pilot. He has memorized 2,000 poems. And at any given time, you can ask Mr. Wetley to quote one, and he'll stand up and start waxing eloquent. But Robert Frost wrote a poem that just kind of reminds me even of this time of the year, and it kind of moves us a little bit, captures something in the way words work, stopping by woods on a snowy evening. It says this, whose are these woods? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. There's pictures that poetry gives us. Poetry is a beautiful thing. Poetry is something that very often is, is overlooked in its power to captivate, in its power to communicate. And what we want to see this morning is one of the greatest poems of the Bible. I want you to notice here with me a Hebrew poem. Now, because it is a Hebrew poem, it does not rhyme like an English poem written by Robert Frost. But some of you, I think this morning, as we begin to look at this Psalm 19, you're going to be blown away what you learn about not only just Hebrew poetry, but you, what you see from the beautiful Word of God. So if you would, take your outline and notice with me here a few things that I want you to see. One of the things is, right here I have a statement, a few statements, and you can look at the screen or on the, on the outline that is here. Poetry may rightly be considered the highest form of art. Now, if you're a painter, you may be a little offended at that. If you're a musician, you could say, well, wait a minute, I composed music. How can you say that that's, that that's more uh, a higher form of art? Well, there's a, there's a reason that we would say it is 
widely considered this in a way. It's not disparaging to the others. God has made us with many gifts, and He's endowed us with many things, and the orchestration of it all together is a beautiful thing. But notice this with me, that while a picture, whether a painting or a photograph or something, a sculpture, something formed with the hands, or a taste, have you ever thought about the culinary arts? We've just enjoyed a bunch of that over December. A taste, or maybe even a melody that is written, while all of those things may be worth what we often say is a thousand words, it's important to remember, remember that it was by words that all that is came to be. It is by words that all that is came to be. You see, in God's universe, words mean much. Notice the next part, and this is underlined on your outline. Old Testament Hebrew poetry specifically explains and proclaims the nature and the will of our Creator God. And so, when we, when we begin to see this beautiful picture of one of the first art forms that we see in the Bible, in fact, it's the only art that we really see in the Bible. Have you ever noticed that as you look through a, a true translation of God's Word, there's no pictures? <laughs> Some of you have Bibles with pictures. Those weren't in the original, okay? Um, those have been added by somebody, right? And, and we, don't, we don't see... We don't see notes, musical notes, of any era, of any millennia that are there. Those are not recorded. Um, we don't see many descriptions of, of graphic images, um, some verbal descriptions of those things, but it's through language that God has chosen to communicate some of the most important truths that we could ever know. In fact, the most important truths that we could ever know. So, there's this, there's this very interesting thing of the, the beauty of not only language and words and, and what we will see in a lot of different forms of that, but especially in the art form of language, which is poetry. Notice the next line that is here, and there's some technical words here, and some of you will track very well with this. Others, this will be kind of new for you, and that's okay. Um, there's so much more that could be said about this. We could spend uh, a whole semester um, dealing with the basics of Hebrew poetry, but notice here with me, poetry often uses sound, so phonetic sounds. Syntax, that's the structure of the grammar. It will use sound or syntax. What about semantics? That means meaning, the words. Sometimes there's a, a symmetry of semantic or a symmetry of meaning. We're going to see that in just a moment. Along with also the idea of rhythm. That's how many syllables are there in rhyme. That's, again, going back to the idea of the phonetic sound going with one another or being opposed to one another. There's also something called secunding sequence. We're going to see that. What in the world is the secunding sequence? It's when there's a one statement and then another statement that is either going right along with it or maybe sometimes even antithetical to it in the exact opposite of it. But in poetry, we see that, especially Hebrew poetry. We'll see this morning the idea of intensification, one statement and then the next statement that ups the ante, that, that makes it a more powerful statement all of which God is revealing Himself and revealing His truth to us. There's also in poetry narrative development. That means it, it gives a progression of one thing happening and then another thing happening or something not happening and then something else happening as a result of that. All of these can be seen in Psalm 19, these 14 little verses. In these 14 little verses put God's glory on display. They put God's glory on display not only in the poetic form, but they also put God's glory on display on the content that is here. And I want, if you would, to look with me at Psalm 19. I, I uh, have been struck by this, this psalm many times in my life. But I believe that the Lord has been leading me to make this my psalm for 2018. 
in 19. And it didn't occur to me till last night that it's 2019 in 2019. So I'm not a numerologist. I don't believe in numerology, you know, this idea of, you know, numbers uh, being something that guides us from everything from astrology to, to other things. I'm not a numerologist. But it just happened to be this way, um, and I think it's so interesting uh, as we look at Psalm 19. I want you to notice this with me, and I'm going to read it very quickly, and then we're going to go back. Be, be very careful to follow along as I read. This is some of the most beautiful words that have ever been written. Psalm 19 and verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of what? The world. In in them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Speaking of the, the, the rotation of the sun, or the, the uh, circulation of the sun that would be there around the, as the earth goes around it. Notice here in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are what? True and righteous altogether. Now look at verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is what? Warned, and in keeping them there is what? Great reward. reward. Flip the sheet. Let's look at the the next three verses. Verse 12, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Verse 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And it ends with this in verse 14. Let's read it out loud together. Verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Okay, flip your sheet back over and look at our paragraph at the top. Again, there midway through that paragraph it says, poetry often uses sound, syntax, semantics, along with rhythm and rhyme. Let me show you this as we look at the beauty of what God does in Psalm 119. First of all, Uh, not 119, Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, we see this, and this is the statement out to the right there. In verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 19, that bracket out to the right is talking about general revelation. And if you would, just circle the word general. Circle the word general. This is talking about general revelation. Put out there to the side somewhere else, creation. This is the universe. This is God's work. Fill that in. It is his works. This is, this is when we look at verses 1 through 6, the psalmist wants us to look out at the world around us and see God's glory. Now, this year, as you go through 2019, you're going to get up and you're going to go to work or you're going to get up and you're going to go about your life and you have the opportunity as you move through life in the next 365 days to see God's glory in the world around you. It's an important concept that Christians need to understand that this didn't just happen as the world would have us believe, or excuse me, as even the satanic lies that would be that that we came from ourselves, that the world happened by chance. 
See, those things are in a direct affront on the very nature of God. In Psalms it says, it is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His sheep and the people, we are, the sheep, we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. The picture is, is that God has declared the world to exist, the world exists, and it declares the glory of God. So we can see who He is in His works. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. You see, all of these things are showing us that the world around you is declaring God. Now, this is important, and I, I, I want you to notice the way verse 1 works. Look at the screen, if you would, in front of you. There's a statement, the heavens declare the glory of God. And then in the next statement, it says, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. There you go. Notice those two things. The heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above. The first two that you see there when you're seeing the way this poetry works, it talks about heavens, and it also talks about what? sky. And then look at the next thing on your outline. And what do they do? The heavens declare and the sky does what? It proclaims. So, declare and proclaim are there. Do you, you start to see what the, the poet is doing here, what God is showing us? The heavens declare, the sky above proclaims. And what do both of them, what are they showing? You see the next part there the glory of God. The first one says, the heaven declares the glory of God. And then notice the next part, the sky proclaims His handiwork. Now, I put some arrows on this, and you can somehow link these just to, to just kind of notice that, that this is the idea of secunding sequence, that there's a statement and then another statement. And it's underlining it, it's, it's showing it. And, it. and it's kind of interesting. If you study a little bit more into the language, you start to see that the word heavens is used 400 times in the Old Testament. But the word sky above is only used 17 times. And so it's a, it's a refining of the thought. The heavens can refer to a lot of things. The heavens can refer to the sky above you. The heavens can refer to the, the starry host. The heavens can refer to um, uh, the, the uh, domain of God's presence when we, when we think about outside of this earthly cosmos that is here. We begin, to, we begin to look at kind of some multiple things there, but here it is saying, no, it's also, it, it is the physical world around you, the sky above. And it's interesting that in the first one, again, the first one is a little bit muted compared to the second one. The heavens declare, the word declare means to simply state, to make a statement. But look at the second statement. It says to what? To proclaim. And in the Hebrew text, there is a little bit of a difference between declaring something and proclaiming it. Do you understand? So, the first line is, is a statement, and the second line is getting more intense. So, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaim His, and the word handiwork, handiwork is barely used in the Old Testament. It's very specific. It's saying this, it's showing off a particular talent. It's showing off a particular ability. And there's lots of particular talents, and there's lots of specific abilities that people even in this room have. Some of the women in this room can sew, and there's even women in this room that, that they make lace, and they make um, various types of knitting and various types of crochet, and they, they make some very beautiful things that are there, and they're, and they're really, really good at it. And there's other people in this room that they're, they're really, really good at software writing and programming. And when they, when, man, they can look at programming and they, they can make it really sleek and they can make it really clean. And so, so whether you're programming a computer or whether you're making something that is, a, is of a fabric, and there, there's people in this room also that are chefs, and they, they, they have this handiwork. And when somebody talks about George Ramos or some, somebody talks about Mike or one of the other guys, and they, they sit there and they say, oh, man, he really does this well. This, this shows off his ability. Here's part of the, what we see here, is that the glory of God is a general statement that, that could be there, that, that would be a very wide statement. But the handiwork starts to say, look at the universe. 
Look through a microscope or look through a telescope, and you will begin to see the, the intricate nature and ability and the complexity and also the simplicity of what God has made in his handiwork. So we're not going to do that for each verse. We would be here till next week. But what we want to do is I want you to start to have an appreciation. You'll be able to pick up some of these as we go. Look at verse 2. Look at what it says. Day to day pours forth speech. And look what it says. And night to night reveals knowledge. So there's the first part of day to day, and then there's just the opposite of that, which is night to night. But they're both dealing with time, and they're both dealing with time on a 24-hour period, a daily purpose for us. But one is, it says it's, it's revealing knowledge, and the other one is saying there, or, or pours out speech, and the other one is saying it's revealing knowledge. So these things that we see in the universe are declaring something. Look at verse 3. It's an emphatic statement. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Here's the picture of this. It's obvious. This message that the universe is shouting is obvious. In fact, we see that just right out there to the side, and you can look it up this afternoon. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, that is the whole picture in Romans chapter 1 where Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's saying the creation declares to the whole world that God exists. Now, there's some who don't want to listen to that. There's some who turn away from that, but they are without excuse, Romans chapter 1 says. In Romans chapter 10, it also, 18 and 19, it's saying some people look at the creation and they don't want to acknowledge what it means. They have chosen to not acknowledge what it means. But it is obvious and they are accountable because of the glory in the universe in which they see. And so verse 3 goes right along with that. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Everyone looks at the world, and it declares the word, it declares the glory of God. Look at verse 4. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and their words to the ends of the earth. And so this the, these handiwork that we see, it's a voice that is going all throughout the universe. Now, notice the, the um, similarity of verse 4, where it says, the voice goes out throughout all the earth. And then look at the next part, words. Here it is. This is a wordless statement, as so to speak, in that the evidence is there declaring who this is. See, so Verses 1 through 6 are the wordless confession. Put out there to the side, maybe on the left. Verses 1 through 6 are the wordless confession of the glory of God. This is when you look through a microscope, you look through a telescope. This is when you get up and you see the sunrise. This is when you go out in your backyard and you see a bird feeding the young, or you see an inchworm moving along the top of the fence, as you begin to look and you begin to see nature all around you, it is declaring the design and the beauty of God's glory. But verses 7 through 11 are different from that. Verses 7 through 11 are a little bit different. I want you to fill this in if you would. First of all, notice here, this is specific revelation, so circle that. It's not just general revelation in the world around you, but when we get to verses 7 through 11, it is talking about God specifically telling you who He is, God specifically telling you His thoughts, telling you what, what He wants. That's what specific revelation of God is. And this is revealing the great glory of God in His words. So he's not just doing it through the stars. He's not just doing it through the molecules. He's not just doing it through the physical science and through biology and through the sunsets and through the glory that's around us. He is doing it now through knowable truth, knowable concepts. So our God is so good to give us language, and that's what we see poetry is, is, is actually is words. It's an expression, and it's a picture that comes in words. So look at verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is pure. The, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord. You see, these are the words of God. 
These, these are not just his works, but these are what he has said. Look at verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean. You see, you, can, you, you don't know what to, what to fear until you hear of God, and then you begin to see that He is a righteous God and that we are an unrighteous people, so we, we should have a fear of this righteous God, a holy fear, not, not a cowering fear that causes us to run away, but a fear that causes us to run to Him. I was looking through some pictures. We went to St. Augustine over the break, and we, we visited our old house in St. Augustine where Cheryl Ann and Andrea um, were, were, that was their first home uh, 17 years ago. And we were in the backyard. Um, the man saw us out front, and he said, hey, you want to come in and see your old house? He even remember, remembered me from 17 years ago. I couldn't believe it. And invited us in, super nice guy. We went in, we saw the house, the girls were there, and we're standing there in the, in the backyard just kind of just noticing things. And I remember one thing, and, and uh, I remember one time the girls were told not to do certain things, and it was usually for their safety or something. And there was one time when we had told them, do not climb on the fence if we're not out in the backyard. And of course, we're in the house, and we're looking out in the backyard, and what are they doing? They're climbing on the fence, and they're little, and um, I'll never forget it. Um, they climbed on the fence, and we, we had told them, if you climb on the fence, daddy's going to spank you, or mama's going to spank you if you do that. And so, um, you know, they, she, she goes climbing on the fence, kind of looking back toward the house, you know, thinking I'm getting away with this, climbing on the fence. We're sitting right on the other side of the sliding glass door watching it. And then we go out, and I stand out there in the backyard, and I just look, and she finally turns around, and she sees me. And she jumps down. And she runs to me crying. She runs to me knowing that she had done the wrong thing. Instead of running away, she ran to me. Now, my friends, let me tell you that that's what God's children do when they fear Him. When we are wrong, when we are in our transgression, the wise thing to do, a godly response, is to run to Him in fear. Now, the wicked run away from Him. The wicked only know to try to get away. But the righteous have found that He is a good and gracious God that says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden with your sin." Come to me, and I will give you rest. The lie of the world is just the opposite. The lie of the world is run away from God if you've messed up. And the God of Scripture shows us in the fear of the Lord, it's clean. And look what it does. It endures forever. You see, the one who fears the Lord, he's going to live forever. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll not die. Though you die, you shall live eternal life. You see, the rules of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Now, as we look at this, there's general revelation of the universe. There's specific revelation of his, the beauty of his words and what he wants. Look at verse 10 and 11. I love this. Speaking of the words of God, your Bible that's sitting in front of you. Here it is in verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, his words, his precepts, his commandments. They are more valuable than gold. Even, and notice what the poetry does, it intensifies. Do you see this? It says it's more valuable than gold, and then what is the next line? Then much fine gold. So it's not just gold, but it's fine gold. You know, a king's gold. Notice the next part. Sweeter also than honey, secunded repeating, we see it again, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Now, I wish we could read this in Hebrew and have a full understanding of Hebrew and even the words. And there's sometimes that there's even, there's, there's a rhyme that is there. There's a phonetically a, a, a similarity that is there that makes it even more beautiful. But for us, if we study and as we see it, even if we do not speak and, and understand the tones of Hebrew, we can still see what God is doing with the text and showing us the beauty and the movement of this poetry. So, it is, it is more desirable than gold, more sweeter than honey. If that is true, why do we spend so much time looking at everything else? You see, 
Notice what it says in verse 11. Here's why God's word is so good for you in 2019. This struck me about two weeks ago as I was studying this. Look at verse 11. Moreover, by them, that is by his words, by his truth, moreover, by them is your servant what? Warned. You see, warnings are good. What if we had a world without warnings? No warnings at all. Can you imagine driving in North Carolina in the mountains? You'd go right off the edge. You, you wouldn't know what's coming. I don't know if you've known this, figured this out or not. Maybe we've just gotten used to it. But when the, when the thing says the road turns this way, it's really helpful to know that when you're going 40 or 50 or 60 miles an hour. When it says it's going this way, it's helpful to know that. When it says this, it's warning you, hey, the road is about to get curvy. You better slow down. Or maybe there's speed limit signs. I mean, when we used to ski in the Alps, it's so funny. It wouldn't say, hey, this is a cliff. It shows a skier. The graphic shows a skier going off the edge of the mountain, you know, and everything's flying away as he goes off the edge of the mountain. I mean, it's like international language. This graphic means one thing. It, it, it doesn't use words. It's using a graphic in that place, in that, in that instance. But the warnings are important. And God very specifically gives warnings to us. He very specifically says, hey, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And if you do this, this is what is going to happen. If you come to me and you know me and you follow me, you're going to have life. If you run away from me and you disobey me, you're going to have death. That's a pretty big warning that is throughout the gospel. And God is saying, come and live. And so the warnings are, are, are very important. And that, that gives, notice what the poetry does. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And then look at this. In keeping them, there is great what? Wow. God always says, I am a rewarder of those who seek me. Write down there Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6 says, For the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. He never misses a payday. He always knows how to reward you. He always knows when you're calling him, when you're looking to him, when you're seeking him, and he always knows what you need most, and he knows how to reward you. Now, I'm not talking about health, wealth, gospel, prosperity, gospel stuff. This is so much better than that. This is the eternal truth of coming to know the one who made you and redeemed you with his own blood. And he says, I know how to make you really live, not only in this life, but especially in the life that is to come. The Bible tells us in Revelation that Jesus is returning and his reward is in his hand. He comes, and he knows, and he rewards. I want to encourage you this morning, as you're looking at this, that the general revelation of God and the specific revelation of God, that you would be looking at 2019 and saying, how am I going to live my life? Am I going to live attentive to the glory of God, or am I going to live attentive to the glory of man and the glory of myself? I, I just want to encourage you as we, as we just, just run through this, that you would say, wow. The heavens declare his glory, his word declares his glory, it warns me, and he promises reward. Why would I look anywhere else? Safe to flip the sheet. Look at the next part. Notice this on the back side, God's glory. You see, when we're talking about God's glory, when we're talking about Psalm 19 showing us God's glory, it's showing us his greatness. And the first part of that is showing us his greatness in his creative power. You can put below the word greatness maybe creation or creation, uh, cre the ability to create. Look at the next part. Not only his greatness, his bigness, but also his goodness. It's showing us that God is good. He's not bad. Satan would have you believe that God is bad, that he has things about him that are, that are false or wrong or that are malicious. And the Bible tells us that there is no darkness in God, that he is completely in light. Notice that he is light. Notice the next part there. His generosity. This God is a God who's generous. And he's generous, and this is a picture of, fill it in, his grace. 
You see, it's, it's his love that motivates his generosity, and he doesn't hold back. This table represents the sacrifice body of the second person of the Trinity. This table represents Jesus Christ being crucified for our sins, being humiliated. God, the one who created everything, is humiliated, saying to us, I love you. This is how much I love you. Let me show you how much I love you. And he's saying, come and trust in me. Come and live for me. That's why this table means so much. It is his generosity and his grace. For God so loved the world that he gave. He is a generous God. So when we call you to give, we're calling you to be like God. When we call you to give your life to him, we call you to be like God. When we call you to give your time and your talents and the resources that you have, we're calling you to act like God. This is godliness because God is a generous God. See, the world is always worried about something being taken away, and God is always saying, let me show you how to give. Not only is God's glory there, but we also see God's Word, and that's the second portion that was there that we just looked at, and in His Word we see His power, we see His promises, and we see, beautifully, we see His pardon. We see the fact that He comes and He brings pardon, and that is what we need more than anything else, because if we only have His power and we do not have the reality of His pardon, then we cannot experience His promises. But because of His pardon, everything is unlocked. Look at verse 12 and 13. Who can discern His errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. And this is, this is talking about a man who says, I, I, don't, I don't even know what all is wrong in me. I just know I'm a sinner. I mean, I can't even tell you what all I've blown. I can't even list all of my sins. Who can discern his errors? And he's saying, but Lord, if you will just declare me as innocent, and even from the things that I don't see, only God can do that. Look at verse 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. This is it. Now, notice what the poetry is doing. There's hidden faults that you don't even see that you're doing that are against the heart of God, but there are presumptuous sins that you know good and well that this is against the heart of God. You know that that lie, you know that that grudge, you know that that whatever it is, that image, you know that that, that underhanded thing, you know that smirk, you, you know those things that are presuming upon God's grace. He says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Look at verse 13. Let them not have dominion over me. That means let them not rule me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Well, there is only one hope that you can have that. There is only one hope that you and I can have the forgiveness of our hidden faults and the strength to deal with our presumptuous wicked hearts. And it's this, our only hope of God's great grace is the salvation of God. And that salvation comes through Jesus. We're going to see that in just a moment. But notice this, it's we need his salvation. Notice the next part, rely on God's forgiveness. You must rely on his forgiveness. That's what verse 12 says, who can discern his errors, declare me innocent from hidden faults. This is crying out for his forgiveness, and not only for his forgiveness, but also his protection. He's saying, Lord, let these things, whether hidden or presumptuous, let them not have dominion over me. Protect me from these things. Deliver me from these things. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus gives us the strength to follow and obey him. So our only hope of the great grace of God is the salvation of God. But the last verse shows us what should be our proper response. How do we respond to the glory in the universe? How do we respond to the beauty of His Word? How do we respond to His offered pardon and His offered protection? Here's the proper response to God's great grace. Don't miss this. Two things. We see it in verse 14, submission to Him and praise. Submission to Him and praise. 
Look at verse 14. We read it a few moments ago together. Look at what verse 14 says. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to what I think is right. Is that what it says? You see, it's not up to what you and I think is right. It's up to what he says is right. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Now, this is, this is going back to Leviticus. This is going back to what is a, an acceptable way to live, an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. And then look at the last part. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, this world is passing away. All the stuff that this world has to offer, its best is going to sink, it's going to burn, it's going to corrode, it's going to rust, it's going to get stolen. I mean, I, I, it was funny. I made a comment on Christmas Eve or maybe even the Sunday before, about, you know, just kind of think about your giving and what you're giving. And I know there's some fun gifts and toys for kids and everything else. But, you know, quite honestly, if you think about a lot of the toys that are given to children on Christmas, you know, a lot of times it just winds up plastic and it, it, it breaks. And within just whether it's a day or whether it's a few months or whatever, it's what already this, this morning I saw one of these electric cars, you know, a pink Jeep, um, that, you know, battery-powered Jeep thing um, in our neighborhood with a bunch of trash piled on top of it. Now, I'm sure that that came from last year or something like that. Now, was there some value in that? And the kid enjoyed it, and they came down the road at, you know, two and a half miles an hour, probably. But just understand that the things that this world has to offer are temporary, whereas God is saying, my gifts to you and my reward to you is eternal, and so when we submit to him and when we learn to praise him, he, you see, he becomes our rock that is not sinking sand. It's not shifting sand. He becomes our rock. And then look at the very last word of the whole psalm. What is the very last word of verse 14? Redeemer. You see, God wants us to see that he is the one who buys us back out of our sin. He is the one who redeems our broken life and our sinful heart. He is the one who gives us value again, all by his grace. Worthy resolutions, very quickly. Based upon Psalm 19, I think it's worth doing this. When you look at verses 1 through 11, flip your sheet over and just remember verses 1 through 11. Remember, verses 1 through 6 was creation, right? The works of God. Verses 7 through 11 is talking about what? Not the works of God, but the what? The words of God. So, he, he, the creation around us and the specific revelation of his works. Okay, flip your sheet back over. Look at one. By faith, I want to encourage you to be resolved to see God's glory in his creation and in his word. I want to encourage you to look for his glory in the world to look for his glory in, in his word. I want to encourage you that by faith that you would say, Lord, help me to see you. Lord, help me to listen to you. Help me to see what it is that you're doing. Help me to see who you are. That's a legitimate prayer for both the Christian, and listen to this, and for the non-Christian. Maybe you would say in this room today, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I'm not sure I believe these things. I'm, 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 learning, I'm looking and I'm learning and, I, and I'm here. I'm open. Well, maybe your, your next prayer is, Lord, help me to see your glory. I want to see your glory. Ask him that he would give you the faith that you need to see him and to believe. Look at the next part here. Verses 12 through 13, which is just right above there, we talked about our only hope being in the salvation of God. Here it is. By faith, trust in Christ's sacrifice for your sins as your only hope of salvation. This is the gospel. When we talk about the gospel, when we talk about the good news, this is the good news. This is what is so critical. It is so critical that you understand that you cannot save yourself and no one else can save you. It is only the second person of the Trinity nailed to a cross 2,000 years ago, dying in your place for your sins. 
and placing your faith in that and in nothing else. Saying, if I believe anything in this world, I believe that Christ died on the cross for those who would receive him. That is what this is, by faith. And for Christians today, you can be galvanized in this. You can be encouraged in this. I can't miss Romans chapter 3. Look what Romans chapter 3 says in verse 21 through 28. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God. This is talking about the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So it's pointing to God's righteousness. That's what the law does. That's what all the Old Testament prophets did. They were pointing to the fact that God is good. Look at verse 22. The righteousness of God through, underline it, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is where you get the God's righteousness. This is how you get it through faith in Jesus Christ. And then look at the next part. For there is no distinction, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all on the same place. We're all sinners falling short of Him. But verse 24, and are justified, anyone who knows God is justified by His grace, circle it as a what? A gift. You see, it's free. This is the gospel. Through the redemption, you remember that word redeemed? Through the redemption that is found where? In your grandmother's faith? In your uncle who was a Baptist preacher? In the big gift that you gave to the Kiwanis Club or to the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital? No. It, 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 the, your redemption is not found in any of those things. Your redemption is found in Jesus Christ. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation satisfaction as a propitiation by his blood to be received. How? By faith. You see, this is, this is where it is. This was to show God's righteousness because in him's divine, because of in his forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who what? Has what? You see, it keeps going back to faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus. There's people that are sitting here today. They've got the church thing, but they're not trusting in Jesus. They're trusting in coming to church. I want to say to you, this table is not about you coming to church. This table is about so much more than that. It is talking about you coming to church in faith in the one who bought the church. And those who are in the church with his own blood. The last one I want you to see here, number three. By faith, be resolved to let God make your life a living sacrifice that is pleasing to him. You see, look at verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You see, this is how we become a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to him. It's only by the grace of God that we can do this. Psalm 19 deserves your attention in the year 2019. I want to encourage you to read this over and over and over. Start picking apart the poetry. But so much more importantly, savor and meditate and appropriate its truth. Would you stand with me for prayer?